Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CEO Next Door podcast, where our focus is on founder stories. I am Mike Mayer, and with me today is my co host, Donovan Morrison, and our esteemed guest, Ari Khan. He is the president and CEO of Bridgeline Digital. How's it going, Ari? Oh, it's going great, Mike and Donovan. Thanks for having me. Why don't you give us the quick elevator pitch of who you are and what you've been up to? Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm an entrepreneur and a uh, computer scientist, PhD in artificial intelligence from University of Chicago, and have uh, launched a few companies, even companies outside of the uh, software space. But uh, my latest venture is Bridgeline. We're a software company that helps online marketers grow their online revenue by increasing traffic to their store, increasing the conversion of that traffic into buyers, and increasing the average order size of each of those buyers. Awesome. How are you doing that? How are you increasing traffic and order size and all those good things you just touched on? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're taking a different route uh, where we're creating a, uh, a suite of apps and a centralized dashboard that's able to evaluate the strength of our customers' sites and give them advice as to what the different apps are that could help them, allow them to experiment because you never know what's actually going to stick and what isn't, and then to be able to select the ones that are working at that particular moment in time. And that's also fluid because, you know, sites evolve, your customer base evolves and so forth. So you want to use different techniques at different times and different combinations of techniques. Interesting. Okay. So are you working with, is it primarily B2C, B2B, mix of both? It's a mix of both. Um, uh, B2B is interesting for us. Um, you know, in general, behind every B2C transaction, there are multiple B2B transactions. So it's a much larger market. It also tends to be a laggard and have larger transaction values. So we've got probably two thirds of our revenue coming from the B2B space, although I wouldn't say that's necessarily two thirds of our customer count. And that is our largest growing uh, segment. So we're uh, we're moving there. Although, honestly, I don't think you could call B2B or B2C a segment. They're just too broad of categories. And we have, um, I have sort of a philosophy that don't try to take over everything unless you're Google or Microsoft or something like that, that can do that level of uh, of, of marketing. So we go after particular verticals. We like to go after verticals that are um, not popular and therefore we don't have huge competition. So B2B electronic distributors is a hot spot for us because mm -hmm. no one's thinking about them and they have a lot of needs and they're growing. <laughs> nice. Got it. So what types of apps are you helping to suggest? Are they primarily marketing focused or all over the board for streamlining operations, um, payments, like what, what types of suites of apps are you usually focusing on? Right. They're, they're outward MarTech marketing, uh, focused marketing technology. Um, here's, I, I'll give you a little bit of a story as to the evolution, how we got here and what it is that we do. Um, and st starting backwards, what we do is we help grow your revenue with a bunch of apps that you can plug into your website and add new capabilities. My uh, after, after I uh, finished graduate school, my first venture was Fatwire, and that was 1996. We started that company just on a shoestring uh, with a credit card and a couple of bucks and soon had uh, IBM as a customer in New York. We were in university, we were at Chicago in the time. Uh, who was having trouble with their website, packed up the van, moved to New York to be with IBM, and built what was one of the very first web content management systems. Content management systems are the platform underneath a website. They are the database and the operating system upon which a site is built. Mm -hmm. um, built that company up to about uh, $45 million in revenue. We sold it to Oracle in 2000 and eight for 163 and I took some time off and saw Bridgeline just coincidentally I was at an investor conference Bridgeline was a roll-up of digital agencies with an identity crisis uh it 
some of the agencies had technology, web content management technology, and it was trying to transform to web content management. And like a typical jackass with zero accountability, <laughs> I sat in the audience, leaned over to the guy next to me. Oh, I was one of the founders of web content management. This company's struggling. I could fix it. Went home and slept like a baby. The uh, uh, other investors started calling the next day. Pretty soon I had invested a quarter million dollars up front. And now like $2 million into the company. <laughs> Like, okay, now I got to put my money where my mouth is and actually fix this company. But the way that to fix it is to stop being a web content management company because that platform space, I mean, I started that space in 1996. It's established. Mm -hmm. And Shopify and uh, uh, WordPress and so on and so forth are, are there and they're there to stay. But you can partner with all of those guys because that platform upon which a uh, a website rest does not have all the bells and whistles, is not super innovative, and is not bringing new ideas to the table and allowing you to experiment. So those platform companies have created marketplaces, much like what mm-hmm. Apple does on the iPhone, where you can go in and, and, and browse uh, different apps. And uh, we partnered with all of those and started creating apps that can help increase traffic by analyzing your ranking on Google relative to your competitors and suggest what you're missing that can help improve that or increasing conversion by automatically making recommendations on your homepage for what the customer might want to buy so they realize you have it and they can click and buy that or increasing your average order value by recommending bundles. And if somebody like Hewlett Packard is a customer of ours, going on this site to buy some blue ink, say, hey, why don't you buy the kit with blue, yellow, and black, and and uh, and, and buy the whole thing, cost a little bit more, but you'll save money in the long run. And by partnering with all of those platforms, those content management systems, by providing a large suite of products that can solve uh, uh, the customer's needs and help them buy something. You really come at the uh, at, at the whole marketing technology space from a little bit of a different angle where our competitors are in general one hit wonders that have one nice idea, but that's it. And we're able to acquire them if we like the idea or uh, beat them in the marketplace because we have multiple entry points and the ability to cross sell between our entry points to our customer bases. So do your do your customers buy a module or do they buy the whole package? How do you how do you go to market? Yeah. So that's an important grow, go to market strategy for us. We want them to buy the module, not the whole package. In fact, we even give some of the modules away for free. One of the things I've learned over the years is that there's nothing more difficult than customer acquisition. Sales is just a very difficult thing to accomplish. And you want to make it easy for someone to become your customer. Now, once you have a customer, that customer acquisition cost, often called CAC, customer acquisition cost in the um, in the SaaS industry, um, mm-hmm goes down substantially because selling a second product into an existing customer is much cheaper. You don't have all of that awareness marketing spend that would be necessary otherwise. So we try to create lots of entree points, even free ones to turn somebody into a customer Mm -hmm. and then provide a, a, an intelligent automated dashboard that makes recommendations with that dashboard being our best salesperson to say, hey, listen, I know you've got this, but consider this and this and this. These can help you in in different ways. So was that dashboard in place and built out when you came on board with the company or is that an initiative that you've helped lead? Uh, The dashboard did not exist. The apps didn't exist. So we were a public company, too small to be public, that was uh, mostly an advertising agent, or not an advertising, a digital agency, and partially a content management system. And the uh, transformation, and didn't happen overnight, was to leverage the access to capital to acquire apps tell all the other content management systems, no, we're not your competitor. We're going to be buddies. Don't believe me. We're going to make, you're going to make your product even better by selling you these other apps. And then uh, uh, eventually building out that dashboard. It wasn't the first thing we did and uh, distributing that to all of our customers. An amazing thing that's happened in the last few years. So my background is AI. And when I was 
uh, doing research, and I worked at uh, Hughes, uh, which had a uh, which was uh, had a subordinate contract at Ravian for the Tomahawk cruise missile, and I was helping building guidance systems, and we were doing all this really fun AI stuff. But hey, I didn't work back then; it was mostly smoke and mirrors. I mean, it really, just didn't work. I mean, all, I mean, I'm like writing my thesis, and I'm like, geez, I don't know if I can write this stuff because. <laughs> But um, but it's come a long way and it really works. And the amazing thing is that it's leveling the playing field for all the people who really want to provide innovative solutions. We're able to create things like our dashboard and uh, and develop new products really quickly because in uh, today's world, AI is not something you have to develop yourself. AI is a service. You can subscribe from OpenAI and Google and IBM Watson and so forth. And the components actually work. They really do. Yeah. And there are all of these middleware uh, infrastructure uh, frameworks to be able to plug them together and do interesting things. So just last week, I sat down with John Murcott, our VP of product management. We said, you know, vector databases, we've got a competitor that's doing interesting stuff with this. We need our customers, if we've got, this for our search product, if we've got a customer with say a thousand photographs of, of, of whatever, and they want uh, one of their customers to be able to search for something like, show me a picture of a, a happy child, to be able to, first of all, figure out which pictures have children in them, which of those children might be happy, how happy they are to rank them and so forth. That he did in one day. He was wow. able to connect to some free frameworks from OpenAI and put it together. And now we sat down with a customer just yesterday, actually, and uh, showed them some of the capabilities that we put together. And now we're only one week into this thing to be able to uh, uh, pre-populate their product catalog and to be able to allow their customers to find things that they need that can never be found anymore Um a huge change. And in fact, let me see, because yeah, here it is. Here it is. This is the, uh, the phrase that just this afternoon we decided we were going to start talking about going from keywords to concepts, because thanks to this particular piece of AI, you're able to know that, well, this photograph has the concept of a person in it that is smiling and is a child and so forth, even though it's not annotated with any of those words at all. And this is just... It's leveling the playing field because small companies can snap these components together. And if you can just think in terms of not what you do and how hard it's going to be, but what someone else needs, and then work backwards from that, you can start creating solutions really quickly. And AI is changing the world of software from one of programming to one of training. And you're just training these systems. It's happening in real time. It's fun and scary, right? A lot of people are scared about it too, <laughs> for perhaps good reason. Yeah. That's so your your current tools, do they take advantage of AI or are they absolutely, in, absolutely. We've yeah. been doing things in the AI uh, spectrum for uh, for a long time. All of our tools have some intelligence in them, but the speed at which we're able to add new intelligence is growing exponentially. What used to take us a year, then suddenly we could figure out in just a couple of months to now where I got guys blowing stuff out in one day. It's really, uh, it, it, it's really amazing. And the AI systems themselves are helping you develop your solution as well. And these systems can even write code in a lot of cases like chat gpt will write code for you if you want to. It's, we don't do that, it's, it's neat what out of your out of your suite of software solutions is your the most popular hawk search is by far the most yeah. popular that is really killing it for us we're growing very it's driving up most of our growth and right. um uh hawk search so this is a product that if you've got a large product catalog uh to help your customers find the products in your catalog with a search dialogue um, and recommendations and rankings and so forth. Um, but it really, at the end of the day, is about the user experience and thinking hard about how somebody wants to shop today and how someone wants to sell. Because a big part of these search dialogues is the back end of allowing what is often called a merchandiser to decide what they really need to sell at that point in time. If it's winter time and you've got a bunch of uh, 
uh, short sleeve shirts in backlog or I mean in uh, uh, in, in excess uh, 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 inventory, you need to find a way to be able to get those things out of your warehouse and make room for the winter jackets. And therefore, the merchandiser has to be able to get ahead of that, tune the search results, or have a system that's intelligent enough. And we we do provide that intelligence mm -hmm. to uh, to figure out that it's time to get rid of all these t-shirts. <laughs> Well, I can be, uh, I can vouch for Hawk Search. I've actually been a customer two times. At, what? Uh -huh, I didn't know this. At two different uh, billion dollar electrical distributors. And electrical and distributors? <laughs> I, that, that's how we got to know each other, I guess. I, Danielle did not tell me that uh, uh, that that's the case. Fantastic. Yeah, so I, I, I can definitely vouch. It's a, a great platform and I had a lot of success with it. It, it helped me to, to succeed. So it was Fantastic. Well, that's our number one product. So thank you yeah. for your support. And we're, you know, continuing to uh, to move with that. <laughs> so so what's his second in the running after Hawk? Uh, after Hawk, it is our WooRank uh, software. So WooRank increases the um, your ranking on, uh, on a Google website. And WooRank actually fundamentally powers our E360 dashboard, which is the recommendation uh, engine that tells you as a customer what other products BridgeLine uh, can offer you. Um, that same underlying intelligence that it has for understanding where you rank within uh, uh, within Google is actually powering how well our different products can help you as well. But um, we've got 2,000 customers with Wu rank, uh, it's uh, winning. Uh, I don't know. I, I think like 200 customers a month, and uh, and there's a very different type of product from a go-to-market perspective than the rest of our software. In that it's a um, touchless sales process where you just go to the website, click, and download it and buy it. Where the rest of our products, like Hawk Search, for example, generally have a salesperson behind each transaction. So is WooRank optimizing your site for SEO? Actually, WooRank is um, is recommending what you should do, and then you're doing okay. it yourself. Got it. And yeah. interesting, uh, part of the, the this whole conversation about AI, now WooRank is actually providing information to Hawk Search, and Hawk Search has a component that is automatically generating keywords and other phrases and auto-optimizing uh, components of your website for you. So we're bringing those two together. That makes a lot of sense. All so right, Ari, you started Fatwire right out of grad school, obviously linked up with Bridgeline. Was it always your intention to pursue entrepreneurship growing up? Did you have that in mind or was that some kind of a, a new pursuit or new path post uh, U Chicago? You know, I was very academically minded and hadn't really thought about it too much. And as I was finishing uh, my thesis at Chicago, I um, uh, maybe it was a little bit of arrogance. I was thinking, like, how could I ever really be, you know, rewarded as well as I should be if I'm working for someone else and he's taking a cut of the action? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so I said, you know, I, and and actually, I remember very explicitly talking to my advisor at the time. I'm like, I got nothing to lose, man. It's like I'm broke, and if this doesn't work, I'll just be broke again, and maybe two years older. So let's go. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's I, I think it's kind of uh, I don't know. I I still believe that for me. Uh, being entrepreneurial is, is is the way to go. Um, now I've got a little bit more experience, understand the level of risk that can be taken and the fact that, you know, if you're a hardworking guy and reasonably intelligent, you 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 can actually make things work. It's it, it's it's very useful to take some risks. I mean, you cannot be like that FTX uh, uh, Sam Bankman guy and take those kind of risks. But yeah. um, but you know, be confident. Uh, uh, trust in yourself because when things get tough, you just work a little bit harder and you think a little bit more and you talk to a couple other people and figure it out. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, uh, it's valuable, and then you're rewarded for the success, which is uh, always feels good too. So was was Fatwire your first venture? That was my first uh, 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 real venture. You know, as a kid, there was all sorts of crazy little things that we did. But um, uh, but uh, Fatwire. What did you 
what were you doing as a kid? Because that usually is foundational forming times where you start to learn to be an entrepreneur. So what 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 help what helped you get to the fat wire level? Well, I don't know if it helped or not. Let's see. So we used to pick beans. So uh, there were a lot of, uh, I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, and not in Saginaw, but in the adjacent town, there were a lot of bean fields, and they would come by on the, uh, with the pickup truck, and you could hop in if you felt like it, and wow. take you out there, and you get paid or whatever it was, uh, two bucks a bag or something, <laughs> <laughs> pick beans all day long. Um, uh, that was a good way to just uh, uh, make a couple of bucks in the afternoon. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Oh, geez. What did I learn? Uh, don't try to put a rock in your bean bag. They'll catch you. Um, <laughs> so, be, <laughs> so integrity. Integrity. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. uh, well, you know, you got to hustle. And, yeah. uh, you know, we wanted to be able to go skiing or do whatever. And, you know, if, if you want to do that, you, you need to do a little bit of work up front mm -hmm. and, uh, uh and, and that was 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 required so you know, what else probably, what else besides picking beans um other than picking beans uh uh newspaper route nice first man had to wake up like oh, five morning it's the worst balance yeah. all those like stacks of papers on your butt <laughs> first first you have to like roll them up i used to oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah you had to roll papers all morning uh, long yeah then balancing on your bike was very hard yeah, yeah, because yeah. you didn't want to have to come back home. You want to just knock it out when you're out. So exactly. You, I remember that you'd you'd, you'd put on two sacks so yes. that they were uh, so they were reasonably evenly balanced, and you kind of get that bike rolling. Oh man, I I had a route. This was like the free one of the free papers they had distributed, and I had my entire neighborhood of 400 homes, and they were thinner papers. But I would try to, I had a basket on the front and I had two satchels behind me, try to balance my bike and deliver them. That was, that was tough. That was actually uh strength building, if anything. Yeah. Sundays were murder. Remember it was always a lot thicker. <laughs> that's but a, you that's know what? Tough, it, yeah. it gives you a work ethic because the distributor guy or whatever the guy was that dropped off all the papers. If you like miss some houses or, or they find whatever, out. He would uh, uh, make sure that uh, you didn't do that. <laughs> do that yeah. twice. And if and I would get calls, um, Michael, please make sure you place the newspaper on the porch. Um, it was a foot away in like on the grass. I'm like, <laughs> OK, I was trying to throw it and I didn't really want to get off my bike. Yeah, especially when yeah. it's one of the earlier ones and you got all yeah. that way. You get off your bike, you can spend five minutes trying to get back onto it. I'm like, I can't believe the nerve of like the customer called in. The newspaper wasn't on my porch, but it, I, you know, I learned lessons. You have to, good customer service is key. Yeah. yeah. To stay maybe out that's trouble. how Jeff Bezos did it. You know, he, he's like, he uh, had to think back, why do I have to have the best customer service? Cause they beat the heck out of me on my paper route. If I miss <laughs> the porch. <laughs> so Ari, what motivated you to pursue AI back in the day? Yeah. Like how did you get interested in going after that? Yeah, you know, um, so I was at University of Chicago, and it was a relatively small department. And I was really uh, just uh, uh, more of a, a math guy and a um, uh, a systems guy. So I like to just program and architect really clean, uh, uh, large code bases that were very extensible. And the hardest problems were really in the uh, uh, in the AI world. Everything else had kind of been done, and I couldn't think of things that hadn't been done with traditional systems, operating systems where their databases were there and so forth. So I was looking for something that hadn't been done more than looking at AI itself. And once I got into it, I gravitated towards computer vision because it's very... Um, uh, very, very mathematical. I was really into math. I spent a year in, uh, uh, in Hungary in a special math program. The year the wall came down, there's some stories there. Um, and, Before you uh, go on, can you explain what computer vision is? Sure, sure, yeah. So computer vision is all about being able to do, well, so there's several different things, but it's really about being able to take a camera and to be able to recognize 
the objects that are in the camera and to be able to do things like uh -huh. predictive tracking and so forth. Computer yeah. vision is really just the first step into something that's broader, which is called fusion, computer fusion, because generally, I'm perhaps thinking a little bit back from the military perspective and uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, missiles, but you have a lot of information that's coming in. You have infrared range finders and sonars and all sorts of other things. So you need to be able to combine all of these signals and to get a, a, a better understanding of what's happening in your environment. And then even then, after you have visually and with these other systems understand what's out there, you still have the next stage, which is, okay, well, what is it doing? And what could I do with it? And if an object, is, you know, looks like a hand and it's going like this to be able to then say, oh, well, there's a human there and that's a hand and they're waving for me to come or they're saying hello and so forth. There's a whole nother uh, set of complexity. But computer vision in general is about getting that uh, sensor information from generally a camera. It can be other things and making some sense out of it. Got it. So, so what were some initial applications of that, both military and non-military, and kind of what, what do you see it most primarily in today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the computer vision, really, I think most of the... Um, the, the early success did happen in the military arena because it's so expensive. The, um, uh, the amount of information that comes in through a camera is tremendous. It's more than even the human brain can process. And um, actually, my thesis was all about figuring out which pieces of that information to um, to process. Uh, there were a lot of attention systems. Attention is all about reducing the information, so you're only processing stuff that matters. Um, and I was doing negative attention. Uh, all right, let's figure out the stuff we don't care about, and then run attention on the stuff that's left. Um, the uh, 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 so um, uh, targeting and automated vehicles. I think all of those early successes really happened in the military spectrum where the funds were available because it was not ready for commercialization. Carnegie Mellon began doing automated um, uh, uh, vehicles in the 90s and was having a lot of success. Um, but I'm sure that that was all DOD grants, you know, Department of Defense and mm -hmm. Naval Research and so forth paying for that. And, um, and, and then finally, you know, the vehicle side is starting to get real. But there's, um, you know, there's so much more to it in terms of just uh, cat automatically categorizing images um, uh, and, and now on the generative side to be able to even generate images given a description is becoming a, 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 a real thing that can be done in the um, uh, you know, civilian context where you just want to you know, automatically create some pictures. It's, so I, I obviously AI has accelerated like very recently. Where where do you think we're going to be in, in a year from now? I just it seems like the pace is unbelievable. And what it is, it is right. And it's interesting to say where we're going to be in a year from now, which is really not that much time. But it, when things grow exponentially, yeah. like AI training itself and so forth, you have to recognize that time periods like that can be significant. Um, I think that, uh, uh, that that there's going to be a huge number of opportunities that open up because there's going to be new ways to solve problems, especially right. in the information space. And, and, and even the physical stuff is, uh, uh, is, is going to see a lot of growth. But in the information space, we don't have to deal with the physical world, which is really complicated, um, creating documents, uh, organizing documents, searching for documents, and so mm -hmm. forth, um, creating code, uh, creating a, uh, um, a a ruling to a uh, uh, to a case in a court and so forth um, is uh, is going to change the way that we the, the, that we add value. Uh, so we. I, I think that, you know, pe people are not going to be replaced anytime soon and we'll be using these tools, but we're going to have to start really thinking differently about what we're doing and what we can count on a, 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 an AI powered system to do for us. And if you are um, running podcast for example you might instead start thinking more about like okay what kind of topics would be interesting to somebody or even looking to ai to find out those topics and networking with people and so forth 
but the you know you could have this max headroom style kind of thing doing the interview and uh you know really uh, intelligently figuring out what questions are most likely to be interesting to whatever audience is most likely to watch this particular episode of the show and so forth and it's more of being the um uh the conductor of the orchestra with uh, uh all of these uh, agents in uh, uh, in in the system that are playing the instruments. Wow, yeah. like capabilities are endless for this, and applications are endless. Yeah, very curious to see where where it goes. Um, I was curious, Ari, from your experience both with starting a company with Fatwire and then coming into a company with Bridgeline, for if if there were to be another business at some point. What has been your preference? Do you like having that control from the ground up and being able to mold it exactly how you wanted to? Or was it nice not having to deal with a lot of those initial items and actually being able to come into something that is relatively successful and then leave your mark? You know, um, that's a really good question. And I think it depends a little bit on the stage in life. And for me, the stage in my life, I wrote an article not too long ago about, um, uh the the evolution of an architect and how you know you start off as an engineer writing lines of code and then you become a team leader and you're managing a team and then you're uh running departments and then you're buying companies and snapping those together as larger and larger building blocks and it takes more resources to move up of that uh, uh that uh ladder as well uh for me personally i like operating today in a uh it, it, it towards the higher end of that uh of that ladder not that one end is better than the other a lot of times but being able to snap together larger building blocks and to be able to leverage uh my experience and thinking what are you know the true higher level needs for larger markets and how can i solve those quickly so doing acquisitions for instance is something that i find particularly uh, energizing. You know, another thing is um, being able to come at problems, uh, and, and I, I believe strongly that you always need to think of the problem first, the customer first, not the solution, because then you get stuck in the weeds, um, but to be able to come to those problems from very different directions. And um, uh, uh, and, and doing that by even shifting from industry to industry, you can be an expert in computer science, but jump into a completely unrelated industry and take that expertise. Between Fatwire and Bridgeline, I started a real estate company and we built resorts in the Caribbean, uh, bought like uh, seven miles of oceanfront and built hundred houses and, re and restaurants and hotels, took pure jungle, put in roads, underground electricity, water treatment, uh, built the beaches, transformed everything. But being able to come at that from an angle where I understood organization really well and how to automate things uh, resulted in sort of an asymmetric warfare with the competitors where they're, you know, just didn't have experience in in that instance, building a website and having automated sales process and having a, a, a CRM to track leads and to be able to market on the internet rather than have a real estate agent knocking on doors and saying, who wants to buy a villa today? Um, uh, go, switching from industry to industry and looking at things asymmetrical is, I think, a, a, a key for success. And it reminds me, um, we were trying to figure out in that instance, that company, um, uh, what the best conferences were to uh, to uh, sell houses and um, uh, and who our demographic was. And we're like, you know what? We got all these doctors buying vacation houses. We'll go to the radiology conference in Chicago mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, we'll be the only one with a, you know, buy a Caribbean villa booth. Everybody else is selling yeah. stethoscopes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to know what we learned? All the sales happened at the hotel to the doctor's wife or husband. So we ended up the next year just by uh, uh, putting a booth up in the hotel, hotel yes. and knocking it out of the park and not like having to compete with the x-ray machine dude is for at the conference. <laughs> so where where in the Caribbean were you? What islands? Uh, in Belize. In Belize. Oh, beautiful. I've yeah, been there. Yeah. 
I love it there. Yeah, Belize is amazing. It's the only English speaking country in Central America, on the mainland in Central America, it's both island and mainland. Currency is pegged to the US dollar, so there's no currency risk. Uh, it's 40% um, uh, of the land is national reserve. The longest living reef in the world, the uh, oh. uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia, uh, is uh, doesn't have a single component that's living that's as long as the Belizean uh, reef. And interestingly, it's right in the path of Paragua, par progress, where um, from Cancun, Tulum, all the way on down to Belize, you've got Mexico, the big enchilada in Central America, <laughs> uh, with tons of money relative to everyone else, just building out that Mayan Riviera heading right down there. So it's a, it, it, it's a great country. But you know what, building um, uh, uh, villas and worrying about uh, whether the buyer was going to agree with my choice of blue when they said make the uh, uh, living room blue and they came home and started crying because they meant a different blue it was not my thing. And after a while, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go write some code. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very stressful. <laughs> that's really cool. Do you guys spend a lot of time in Belize? I haven't been there in a few years. You know, back when I was doing that, it was fun. My kids... Uh, our today I've got two boys 14 and 12 so that was uh, at that time they were like uh, two and four or something like mm -hmm. that and uh, we'd go down there and we had horses and you know, the kids on a horse and all this big equipment excavators and stuff so let the kid dig a hole last time that I went the um, uh, my team had uh, uh, built an island for us and buried a treasure and put a uh, mm -hmm. palm tree on it and the kids uh, uh uh, paddle boarded out to that and found their treasure which is uh, uh it was That's pretty cool. awesome but i haven't been there in a bit <laughs> what a great experience so it you know you you run a, a pretty significant size organization and and you have a family how do you balance between the two what what is your what's your like typical day you know what do you do to stay sane yeah yeah, yeah. well i'm lucky to have a uh 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 amazingly multitasking wife who mm -hmm. uh is uh able to run the uh, uh the day-to-day -day pretty well so i give uh, i give her a, an awful lot of credit um uh you know my day generally is uh i i need to exercise more I do not exercise enough um uh but I, I i rush off to to work pretty uh, uh pretty quickly and spend most of my day in the office. I like to just, you know, you, you build a lot of strong relationships and friendships and, and so forth in the office and spend most of the time there. And we try to make that fun as well with a little barbecue area in the back uh, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, feeling good about that, but spend as much time with the kids as I, as mm -hmm. I can. Boy Scouts, skiing, um, convincing them to walk the dog or I'll walk the dog <laughs> and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the main thing. You know, we decided, actually it was my wife's decision to uh, to make skiing our family thing. And that was really, really smart. So we have focus. The kids have become, I consider myself a very good skier, but all of a sudden the, even the 12 year old is uh, uh, leaving me in the dust. <laughs> and, um, but, but picking a family uh, event and having favorite mountains in our instance and a house in Vermont and so forth that we can, you know, kind of nice. keep it easy with is uh, uh, makes life a lot easier. allows it a lot easier for us to um, be cohesive as, from a family to have something to talk about and to mm -hmm. uh, be passionate about or something. So, you know, picking that one big thing for us has been really great way to, uh, to build a family. I see a bike in your background. Is that is that often used? Is, do you get take that to work, or is that um, just yeah? That's in that's in my office. So that bike right there, I got a screaming deal on it. It was uh, uh, some uh, uh, lady up the road. Kid went to college, and she's like, "I gotta get this bike out of my uh, out of my garage." Um, and uh, right across the street from our office is a large park. I bring my dog into the office pretty frequently. And uh, the small, like thirty-pound dog, and um, uh, and and she's very well uh, trained, so I can take her around without a leash. And we'll go off into that park and just cruise up and down the uh, the trails till she's completely exhausted, and Fun. I get a chance to be outside there. 
So Ari, what's next for Bridgeline? What does the future hold? Yeah, well, you know, it's a uh, uh, it, it's it's an interesting time for Bridgeline. It's a very tricky market right now because on the one hand, um, uh, acquisition targets are getting a lot cheaper. The private market is uh, uh, still not down as far as the public market is, which makes things a challenge. Public market for microcap companies is down, um, but uh, we'll continue to look for what we call inorganic growth to be able to buy the right uh, companies that have the right customer bases also that we can expand through. But I think the most exciting thing is not necessarily that, but it's going to be some of the innovation that we've been doing in-house in the lab that we're bringing out. You know, most of the time we like to uh, fund uh, new features and products in partnership with a customer. That way, you know that at least one person cares about the new feature and you're not completely just making something up that you think is important. And um, so we've got some great uh, innovations there and they all really center around AI. Earlier today, we were talking about go-to-market strategies and uh, building out a, um, uh, a sequence of messaging to tell the world about where we're going in that direction. But you should expect to see some very interesting new products and AI uh, features to existing products, both uh, mm -hmm. coming out in uh, uh, in the upcoming months. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, you know, the engineering team, they're all, you know, fighting over who gets to work on what project. It's, it, it's great, you know, when they're like, you know, I, I want to, you know, stay up all night and work on this one today. Like, uh, okay, uh, make sure you get home and get some sleep. Uh, let's do it. <laughs> well, I know we're nearing the end of your day. So um, maybe you can share some, you know, final nuggets of wisdom, lessons learned as you've gone through your entrepreneurial journey that you like others to benefit from. You know, I think that probably the number one thing, and it took me a while because I'm kind of introverted, uh, is um, know your customer well. Uh, you know, that is where uh, where, where everything matters. Um, and by the way, uh, don't just get to know them because there's a problem. After the fact, that's the wrong time to meet somebody. Right. Well, things are going well. Spend some time and get in, uh, on the phone and the Zoom face-to-face -face with that customer. But sure. um, it's all about the end user, what they really need. Don't mm -hmm. breathe your own fumes and just sit there and build something because it seems fun to you. If it doesn't touch the real world, it you know, it could just be a hobby instead of a company. Um, so uh, uh, it, it, it's great to be an engineer and a builder and so forth. But if you don't get out of the back office, you might end up uh, with a hobby. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, I've, I've made that mistake myself, uh, rolling out my first B2B e-com platform or my, yeah, it was my first without really knowing my customers and what features and functions they wanted. And I rolled it out and they really didn't care and didn't use it. So getting yeah, out in the field. That's how I learned it too. I made yeah. some things that everyone was like, oh, that's neat. What yeah. else? Yeah, but that's not what we want, right? Getting out in the field and getting to know the, your customers and their needs, that should have been my first step. So now I know that, you know, going forward. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Ari, thank you so much for your time today. This was a very interesting conversation and uh, best of luck to you with Bridgeline Digital as you continue to, to grow. Well, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate your time today. I'm very excited to know that you're a hawker and uh, <laughs> Don, it's sure. been great to meet you as well. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Likewise. Thanks, Ari. Everybody got a dream, let me show you all love From an idea, working it into a startup That's This right. the show that you need, what more could you ask for? Never know who become the CEO next door uh, uh, Tune in, every episode insightful The type of vibe you will want to subscribe to Let's go Hey.